That was, now, as many of you can tell, if, we, if you've been in worship the last couple of Sundays, we are switching uh, our track and themes. Uh, we have gone through a lot of different themes uh, this year so far. We've started out our, our new year with trying to regain our, our sacredness, our intimacy with our God. And we've done that by doing this thing uh, with John Burke's book, with 60 Minutes with God. And what we did, for many of us, we had a, a phone go off, our watch go off. Some of us, I don't know if anybody tied ribbon around their finger. That's kind of old and done, I guess. But um, the, we had reminders set around us to remind us that every 60 minutes on the hour that we would uh, draw back to God. We would pray to God. We would open our Bible. Uh, we would talk to someone about God during that time. We'd retroflect about the last hour and how we'd like to continue to praise God. So we spent all this time of looking inward and saying, God, how can I draw closer to you? And I believe that has been so fruitful for this congregation. We've also came to a time of, I did a very short sermon series on the, on the vision of our church. And it's to love God, to love people, and to serve. It's one of those very concrete, simple things that we can grasp onto and do. And I think that's been very helpful for us uh, to realize that we need to do all three of those to be a vital congregation. And with that, to continue to be connected with our God in, intimate, in, in ways, intimately and with ways in which God has called all of us to be disciples of sharing the good word with all. Which, uh, which, go, which our whole theme for the United Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Now, we're not going to ever get away from that because every time we have a Sunday, we, we say it's a mini Easter, right? We're always coming together to celebrating the grace that God has given us about when we come to the Lord's Supper and we're reminded of the death and resurrection. This no, doesn't leave a death of the resurrection that we have, that God makes a mini resurrection in us each and every day, moment by moment, that our original sin, our evilness, our, our tendencies to stray from God, whatever language you use, God says, you don't have to mess with that anymore in the sense that you are forgiven. Now, it's not a free pass. We know that. But it is hope. It is hope that this world needs desperately. So I'm hoping that we can continue that conversation, and especially in the next two months. We're, I've got an eight-week sermon series starting today. Um, and what we're going to be doing is we're going to, uh, if you guys know Thomas Aquinas, uh, 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 Thomas Aquinas uh, and he is Seven Deadly Sins. Um, we, we talk about these. Oh, here, I don't know if I was able to do this, but would you, does anybody here think that they can name all the seven deadly sins? Let's see if we can, what's like one of the bigger ones? Yeah, greed is one of them. Gluttony is one of them. You're not going in my order, but yes, sloth works too. Envy, yeah, we got that one. Yeah, that's part of it, yes. Anger, wrath. Now, what about the, 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 the one that we, we can't talk about in church? Well, adultery, lust, that'll be part of it, yes, very good. Uh, and then the, the biggest one that I thought, I th someone may have used differently, pride. Pride is the one. Did someone say it? Okay, I didn't hear you. Sorry, Pastor. Yeah, if that's true. And yeah, what? I know them. Uh, right, that's very good. So we've got the seven deadly sins that we're going to be talking about. And, you know, some of you may be asking, why in the world, Pastor? You know, you, you, you've been here for three years now, and almost all of your sermons are about hope and grace and passion. Why now? Why are we going to be changing our focus to looking at sin? Well, I've got this book that has convicted me in many ways. Uh, William, uh, William Willman, which I can't say his name, is, was a United Methodist bishop. He's now uh, serving as a professor at Duke Divinity School, which I'm envious of. And um, he wrote this book years back, and he wrote it again. It's a very provocative book in the sense that the title is Sinning Like a Christian, uh, A New Look at the Seven Deadly Sins. And when I read this, um, I was like, man, you know, these are, these, they've got some really great nuggets of truth, of wisdom that I could share and that I can learn from, and I want to share this. And I got on fire for it, and I got excited. And, you know, we wait for these Holy Spirit moments of saying, God, when would be a good time for this? You know, last summer I did the hook of the Disney movies and said the gospel according to Disney and trying to get people in, and we watched uh, movies together, and we did all that stuff. And this year I'm like, I don't know how much, you know, uh, if the sin is bringing people to the movie theater, maybe I can get them in the church. I don't know. Uh, but I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, let's see what we can do here. Um, so 
I was praying about this, and I kid you not, I was in my office reading uh, this book, and my friend calls me. He's a United Methodist pastor in the Indiana Conference, and he said, Billy, I could use some help. And I go, yeah, you know, you're calling the wrong person, but I'd love to help you. What's going on? And he said, listen, um, I, I've, I've kind of like had to take back and think about this again. I was in a Sunday school class, and one of my parishioners, which is a fancy word saying, one of the members of the church, came up to me and said, hey, you know, I'm coming to church, and I love all this faith, peace, grace, love stuff. That's great, but why is it that you never preach about sin? Why is it that we never talk about sin again, uh, uh, ever? And my, and my pastor friend was taken back by this, and he says, whoa, whoa, you know, that's what grace and peace and this whole story is about, is that death on the cross for whose sin? Our sin. You know, it's the, I mean, like, what is this person doing? So there's some loss in translation that just because there's not the hell, hell and brimstone, on, you need Jesus, you know, going on, that there, there's been this loss in translation that we're not talking about sin. I know, I have bad impressions. They come out occasionally. I'm sorry. Uh, and, you know, we have all this impression that we're not talking about sin. And I'm sitting here going, what about me as a pastor? How am I talking about the need for God's grace, the need for salvation? And do we even know what sin is? Do we talk about it in sin ways? So sin in ways that are tangible and knowledgeable to us that as Christians, we can grab a hold of them and say, yeah, I need to be saved of that. So that's kind of where my conviction of this is that I'm like, whoa, this has been very powerful in my personal life. And I believe that it's got nuggets for me to share, uh, nuggets of truth or wisdom um, that I can share with you. So that's kind of where I'm coming from of why we're doing the seven deadly sins. Now, is the seven deadly sins, can you find the, these in a list in the Bible anywhere? Yes or no? No. And people are very, uh, you know, surprised by this. You know, why aren't we preaching on the Ten Commandments? Why, why didn't I just preach on the, the one that Jesus, Jesus just gave us a list, right? Sexual mortality, uh, immor, immor, immorality, not immortality, that'd be different. Uh, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. There's all these different things. Just stay with me. Uh, try, try your best. Um, there's all these different things that God has given us a list. We've got lists here. What happened was is these, these think tank came together, and they said, that first they kind of called them the seven mortal sins. Maybe you've heard that. Or the seven cardinal sins. And they used to use this language of, you know, these are things, these are the seven deadly sins that are innately human. Do you get that? These are things that we just really have trouble getting away from. It's, uh, or another way is it's like the, ch the child uh, uh, of what is about to become of murder, of what about to become of, of, of these things of idolatry, right, of putting God before us. All these things that the Ten Commandments get, the Ten Commandments are great, and we should not murder, and we shouldn't do all these things. I am not taking away any of that. Don't go out and say, hey, my pastor said, okay, no, there's none of that, right? is saying that these are the foundational things that, that are, are that thing that, that God is looking at us. And I say us as a community of faith. Many of us, you know, we say, oh, we're not, we're not hypocrites. He's looking at, Jesus looks at us and goes, you hypocrites. And I'm going down the aisle. I'm not looking at anybody because I didn't talk to you before or anything, right? Is that you hypocrites. And you know that the hypocrites is a drama uh, uh, thing, that, uh, a phrase, excuse me. Excuse me, I'll get my arms out of there in a second. My, the, it's a phrase, a drama that's saying that you're pretending. You're not, you're not living out what you're, what you're saying. You know, if we put it more in a Christian context, that we are all hypocrites. So you say that you're doing what is of God, but you're making up your own rules. So I think with this, with this gospel that we have today to glean from is, is that is our hearts right with our God? And I've done this in almost every sermon I've done this year is, is that, is there anything keeping you away from your God? Sin keeps us away from our God. Let me, let me say, get some working definitions. If, if you'd be willing to respond, if not, uh, don't worry. I'm not going to call on you. What would your working definition, I don't need a dictionary definition, of sin? What is sin? Anybody? Pat, you said something. Go ahead. Doing wrong. Anything else? Working definition of sin. Very good. Man, you guys read my notes. Separation from God. That's a good one. Any, any, anybody else? What is, what is sin to you in a working way? 
Yeah, against the laws of God. Very good. If we go to our Hebrew, thank you for participating, by the way. If we go to our Hebrew and Greek, it's, it's, it's as literal as I can get with you is missing the mark. You guys have heard the mark of the beast, right? 666. I was running with someone uh, the, a couple weeks ago in a mud run, and they had the number 666. And they're like, oh, don't stand by her, right? And I, I was able to give them a little bit of history lesson. You guys know seven is usually the number of perfection, right? So 666 would be missing the mark, missing the mark, missing the mark, right? It's that uh, not yet perfected. So when we're talking about sin, we're not talking about, oh, I, I, I hit my sibling. Um, oh, I, I stole a, a small piece of candy. We're talking about full-out transgressions against our God. And a lot of times we don't think of it this way, and that's why... Um, I don't think I have the quote in front of, a, uh, of me right now because I'm off kilter here, but there's a quote in the book that the author shares about is that the only way that we can know of, uh, of our sins is in the mirror of the cross. And what the language is getting at is by coming to church, we are made aware of our transgressions. We're made aware of our sin. And in doing so, we can then make choices in the, the, the shadow, if you will, of the cross and light of our Savior, that we can be made aware. That, that whole accountability word, we don't like to talk about it because keep being held accountable is not easy. I don't care if it's work. I don't care if it's in your social life. It's in your personal life. Being held accountable is tough stuff. And being the friend that's saying, man, I really don't think you should be going to that club tonight. You know, that is not an easy thing to do. Saying, ooh, you know, i really like to see that movie too, but you know, you're dealing with that right now, and I, don't, I think that may be a trigger for you. I don't think we should go to that movie. This isn't easy stuff. This is hard stuff to keep each other accountable, but that's what our Christ, our, 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 our Lord and Savior, is letting us know that of our sin so that we can move from that. C.S. Lewis, I do have a quote here. He says, it is a policy of the devil to persuade us that there is no devil. Uh, there's a movie, uh, Constantine. I've used this quote before. I love the movie Constantine, if you've seen it. I don't recommend it. It's not a very good movie, but I do like it. I, uh, guilty pleasure. Um, there's a uh, quote in there, and the woman says, um, uh, the devil? That's fairy tale. I don't believe in the devil. And he said, you should. He believes in you. You know, it's that whole idea that we want to be made believe that our sins aren't sin, and, and, that, and that we just want to move away from that. And that is an issue that we, we deal with in our life. So what is sin? Sin is simply, just like you said, is that, is that separation from God. What are we doing that separates us from God? So we're looking at the seven deadly sins. And I yes, I will have to look again because I usually get them wrong. Pride, envy, anger, sloth, greed, gluttony. And lust, and you may not be familiar with that word, but it's all stuff when you read it and you go, oops, done that, oops, done that, oops, done that. Why? Because it's, these, it's these, these things that can grab a hold of our heart. And no, I may not be out murdering somebody, but if my greed gets so bad, well, there's a story in the paper about a man killing his wife. Why? Because of the insurance money. Greed is that, and those things that kind of just get all wrapped up in us, that if we don't let it go, if we let it fester and let us, let us grow, it takes over our lives. So they're not just mortal sinners, cardinal sins, they're deadly sins, sins that lead to death on a level of our souls, of our relationships with God. It's not just a humanly death, but a, but a death that would separate us from God. Now, I've, I've shared my philosophy or my theology with you that heaven, I don't know what it's going to look like. Streets of gold, that'd be amazing. You know, light and white and halos, and I'd be able to fly like Superman. I mean, I think that would be awesome. Maybe if I had cool powers too, could pick up a boulder or something. I don't know what God's going to give me. But what I do know is that being in heaven is being in the presence of God. And hell is being away from my God and that hope and that peace and that love and that care that that God has for me, even in the midst of all my sin. God loves me. That is a heaven that I do not want to miss out on. So that's why we're going to take a look at some of these things that are so little, 
so minute. There's a movie called Seven. Has anybody ever seen this movie? It's older now. It's maybe five years older. There's one gentleman. Thank you, the bearded man. Thank you, sir. So we've got, uh, I like beards, sorry. Uh, so there, there's a movie called Seven with Morgan Freeman, and I think it's Brad Pitt. Ooh, heartthrob, right? Uh, he's in the movie, and they, they show, no, sorry. Okay, uh, so they show the, uh, the, the this serial killer doing all these ki uh, killings and it's all gruesome because they've all done lust, uh, uh, sloth, and they've done all these seven deadly sins. But that's not what it truly is about. It's not this big show uh, of what it's about. We all are sinners. As my father uh, let me know, and he's sitting here today, uh, so I get to embarrass him, but uh, as my father shared with me when I was growing up, uh, he would come into church, we'd look around, and he's a wise guy if you don't know him, and he'd look around and he'd go, man, look at all these sinners in here. You know, uh, it's just reminded that we are all sinners and that we all, he even shared a joke with me today about sinners, that, uh, it, you know, what did, teach, what did the pastor say about sinning? Oh, well, he was against it, you know. Uh, sin is a part of our church, of who we are. And there is one thing that we have to be incredibly aware of, is that we need to be aware of sin, we need to be accountable to our sin, and we need to ask for forgiveness and move away with our God and our community together in this. But well, there's the one thing that we are not to do. And the best word that I really have to use with this is to not become obsessed with sin. So much that we go out and we try to grab onto it and figure it out. Oh, I don't know what lust is about. No, okay, we're not supposed to do that. Maybe the skipping was a bad illustration, right? But, uh, you know, the lust is you don't go out and you try to figure it out and you try to get imagined with it and you get, you get all infatuated with it. And boom, and there was a good word to go with lust. Infatuation to go with all this and to go through. That's not what it's about. When I was in middle school, um, I got called in middle school the ministry. Now, I didn't really respond to that call very well, but I started getting into Scripture. I went on a spiritual retreat that I was on this mountaintop experience with God, and everything was going great. And then all these, I noticed that all these people that they were bringing into school with the FCA and to my church to talk with the youth, they all had amazing testimony uh, stories. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about here. The amazing testimony stories. You're like, man, that person was a bad person choice words. Man, I would, I just kind of like grew up and I loved God and that's about it. You know, you know the stories, right? They've got the motorcycle, they've got the tattoos, they've got the cocaine stories, they've got the sleeping around stories that they woke up, they don't know where they are. You know, they're on the last luck, they don't know what is going on and then God comes in the midst, a friend, a Bible, something happens in which God grabs a hold of them and they're brought back and they've got this amazing testimony stories and I go, I used to be going, Golly gee whiz, I was grown in a house that told me that I should love God, and I do love God, and I want to tell everybody about it, and that's about where I am. And I remember, I remember thinking, man, I need to go out and do some cocaine. <laughs> I need to go out and take drugs and do these things so I can have an amazing story. That is not what God wants for us. Instead, if that is a similar story to you, I want you to say that you have an amazing story, that you never had to leave God to find God. What an amazing gift that we have been given. And if your story is transgressed and your path is wide, we thank God that you are here today and that you're getting that relationship with God. I don't know where you are on your path, but God says sin is there, and I want to help you through that. There's all this. Now, if you come and follow me, that hot coal's there, you're still going to have to walk on them. Thus, trials and tribulations that you're going through and that you know, your, your husband leaving and, or the kid passing away, you know, oh, but I'm going to walk alongside with you and there is going to be hope and that there is going to be life everlasting in you. Why? Because the Holy Spirit will be living in you. So that is the reason why we come to church. And that is the reason why I believe it's so important that we will go through each and every time and talk about pride, envy, and so on so that we be, can, can become aware of them, not to be infatuated or obsessed with, but to be aware so that we can see the light of God in all this, that the Holy Spirit can come and transform us, and so that we can come to the table knowing that our God has died, has died our death, went down to the pit, and has come up and been resurrected, for us. Do not take this lightly. When we talk about grace, it's amazing. When we talk about God's love, it is amazing. So when we come today in our Lord's Supper, our Eucharist, our Holy Communion, when we come together
to remember this sacred moment in our lives, don't take it lightly because we have the best birthday, anniversary, Christmas gift that one could ever have. Well, Christmas is the birth of Jesus, but we get that, right? That we have is that God has forgiven us all of our sins. It's not a free pass, but it is a hope that this world and that each of us needs so desperately. So I encourage you now, if you'd like to follow in the litany with me on page 13, I think we